second year I've been here, and I'm glad to be here again. Uh, my name is Scott Hunter. I work at Microsoft uh, on the .NET platform, and I'm here today to talk about the future and roadmap of .NET. Uh, to start off with, um, we always use these kind of boilerplate slides. You know, we've made .NET over the years. You can build any type of application on .NET, whether it's web, cloud, mobile, desktop, AOT, uh, IoT, A, uh, um, machine learning, anything you can do with .NET. Um, Talk about some of our customers. Um, so I showed this at Build uh, earlier this year and really, really enjoyed it. I've got uh, a couple of these, if the clicker works. Clicker is not clicking. There we go. Um, a company called Setpoint. Um, they're using WPF on .NET Core 3, so they've already ported one of their applications uh, to .NET Core 3. Um, they did that because they wanted to access some of the modern Windows 10 APIs. Um, UPS, if anybody's ever seen the UPS application, that's actually a Xamarin app. It's the same app, uh, both on Android and iOS, using the exact same code base. Uh, so they're, they're on top of our mobile tech. Uh, this is a great one as well. This is Siemens, and what's important here is they're actually using .NET Core with microservices on Linux. Uh, in Azure Kubernetes. Um, and then I've got another cool one. This is uh, Evolution Software. And uh, they are actually doing some uh, machine learning uh, to actually, for their hazelnut dryers, that predict when the hazelnuts will actually be dried using some of our new ML technology. So that's just a handful of customers that are actually touching a lot of the new technologies that we're going to show today. Um, .NET. Uh, .NET's been around since 2002. Um, and we're still growing. We added a million new .NET developers last year. Um, and even cooler, .NET Core has passed the 1.1, the 1.2 ish now actually uh, active users. So .NET Core has been out for about two years. And in two years, we've got 1.2 million customers on .NET Core. Um, super happy about that. Um, today, we have a lot of stuff. I'm going to go fast because I want to do uh, a bunch of demos. I have about 10 demos that we can do today. Uh, but we're going to touch on big data, which is new to .NET, machine learning, uh, mobile development, Windows desktop, C Sharp 8, uh, microservices. And then finally, we're going to talk a little bit about uh, what's beyond .NET Core 3. Uh, so let's start. Uh, there's, a, there's a piece of tech out there called Apache Spark. And um, it's, it's a popular open source project for doing big data. Um, and the problem with big data has been, for all these years, if you want to do big data, you had to use Scala or Java um, or a little bit of Python. And there was not any solution for, for .NET. But uh, we just announced a few weeks ago, we now have .NET for Apache Spark. Uh, now, most people in the room probably don't have enough data for this to matter. You need to have like terabytes of data to, to actually use this. But we use this te technology at Microsoft. Um, when you actually use Visual Studio, um, the, your crash reports and your information on performance of Visual Studio is pouring into Microsoft uh, so we can analyze it every week uh, using Apache Spark, actually. Um, and so what you can do with Apache Spark is you can actually query it using either a SQL-like syntax or a syntax called data frames. Um, it's great for doing streaming analytics. Uh, it's great for doing machine learning because you have lots of data. Um, and uh, it is also very, very fast. Uh, so this is an example of us doing a benchmark of .NET versus Scala versus Python in the Apache Spark space. Uh, before we'd even ship this product, I wanted to make sure it was fast enough. And so uh, you can see that uh, we're second in this list. Uh, Apache Spark is, uh, our, our Scala is number one. That's because Apache Spark's written in Scala. But of the non-Scala type languages, we're the fastest there. Um, and there's still work we can do. We actually think we can actually even catch Scala there. Um, and so my point is, if you're going to use .NET with Apache Spark, um, you can actually do that uh, and make it happen very fastly. So I'm not going to do a demo, really. I just want to show an example of what we think of um, in this space. And uh, so what I've got here is there's a project on, uh, out there called GH Torrent. And GH Torrent is pretty cool. They basically took all of the data from GitHub and shove it into a database once a month that you can actually grab. Uh, so I click on Downloads here, and I click that. Um, you can see that here is 
what you're looking at here. You're looking at a 102 gigs, um, and that's actually compressed. If you unzip that, it ends up being about 350 gigs of data. Um, and then what's cool about this with Apache Spark, um, what I've actually done here is I've actually taken all that data, shoved it up into an Azure table storage. You can kind of see here the size of some of these things. These are huge, huge data files. And then what I can do is I can query those using C Sharp. Uh, so this is a, the actual code that does this. Um, and if you look here, it's not very complicated. We create a Spark session. We give it a pointer uh, to our file uh, uh, storage account in the cloud. Um, we then basically say we need to create what we call some data frames. We have to go mimic and say, of those CSV files, how do they map to the actual data? So I've got a, a list of commits with a, with a schema, a list of watchers with a schema. I've got a list of projects with a schema. Um, and then I want to start doing some queries here. So I'm going to query and say, I want to grab basically the top uh, projects based on stars. What are the most popular projects uh, in GitHub? And this is just showing I could actually have done it in SQL as well. There's the SQL syntax if you like SQL. And then what I can do is I can say, hey, I want to grab the projects. Um, and you're going to look here, if I look at projects, it's going to grab those. And then I can basically do something complicated here. So I'm going to go find, do a query and say, look at all the projects of the top 10 projects and find which days commits actually happen, happen on. Um, and so this ends up being uh, a, a pretty crazy query. I have it running up here in, in uh, Azure. And uh, what I can basically do is upload that code to Azure, run it in Azure, and that query against 350 gigabytes takes about 30 seconds. I'm not going to run it on stage, uh, but the end result of this is something like this. And it shows you that uh, some of these you would expect, these are the most popular GitHub packages, are, uh, in, and you can see things like CoreFX, Roslyn, CoreCLR. Now, what's interesting about this data uh, is look at which days you can see the Microsoft projects don't have any commits on the weekends. I'm not going to show my bosses this, but all the open source projects, the, the real community-driven open source projects, they all have commits on the weekends. Um, and so it's kind of hard to demo Apache Spark, but uh, the idea is if you're using .NET and you want to do big data, uh, you can do so. Now, let's talk about some even cooler tech. A few weeks ago, we also RTM'd uh, ML.NET. And this is basically the machine learning library that we built for .NET developers. Uh, this allows you to build uh, .NET models or build ML models in .NET. Um, and the point is, we want to make ML something that everybody can use. And so notice that we say that uh, we, we have so you can build stuff with AutoML. AutoML is some cool technology that will actually figure out the best ML auto algorithm for you. Instead of you having to go figure out um, which algorithm is the best for your data, uh, AutoML will try all of them for you. Um, Everything's extensible as well. You can use all the, the popular buzzwords. If you want to use TensorFlow, you can use TensorFlow with ML.NET. Um, and even cooler with ML.NET is we've been using it at Microsoft for many, many years. If you're using Office uh, or you're using uh, Windows Hello to log into a laptop, that's all using ML.NET on the back end. And so this is trusted technology we've been using for over 10 years uh, inside of Microsoft. But the next challenge is when I ask my customers, who wants to use ML? Everybody will raise their hand. And then I say, what are you going to do with ML? And all the hands will go down because they don't know how to use ML. So one of the things that we're doing at Microsoft is we have put together on uh, .NET slash ML a bunch of common machine learning scenarios that you can do with the technology. And for each of these, sentiment analysis, recommendations, there's a sample that goes with that. So you can actually take each of these things, put your data into them, and use them as kind of cookie cutters to get started with the technology. Um, and so that kind of is our, our idea of making it easier. But we thought we could go a step further. And so uh, we, have a, we have a new preview out on our .NET slash ML page of something called Model Builder. Um, and so what Model Builder does is, hey, I know that getting started with machine learning is hard. What if I could make it even easier? So Model Builder is basically a, a wizard you can run inside of Visual Studio. And what it will do is you point it at some of your data. Um, and it will then go and tell it what you want to predict. And it will then run all the algorithms across your data. And it will actually build you um, the uh, model for your project and write the, write the code for your project as well uh, to make it very fast to build an, a machine learning type application. So let's try this. 
And this will be a theme today um, across a variety of, of things. So here is a, an app that I have, and this would be very similar to what you would see in many cases. If I run it, imagine a site like where you go and rate products or you put a review up, you know, you could type some text in here. This product is not good. Um, but it would be cool if I could use machine learning as somebody writes a review on my product to actually know, hey, there's some bad reviews. Maybe I should go look at that, look at that product, uh, look at my product and figure out what I can do to make those reviews better. Uh, so let's add machine learning to this project. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to right click on the project and I'm going to click add and machine learning is a new option because I've installed the model builder. And then you're going to see those same boxes you saw in the, in the slides. Sentiment analysis is here. I can click sentiment analysis, and then it says it wants a file. Um, or I could select SQL. So I can point this to either a, a flat file in disk or a, or, a, or a SQL instance that I have that has data in, in, the, in the, the database. I'll use a flat file here. I'll go to my desktop. And what I do is I have the, the way machine learning works is you have to have some data that's actually been trained already. And what I mean by trained data is you need some data that you actually know that if I have like 1,000 reviews and I've gone through by hand and said, These, this one's a good one, this one's a bad one, this one's a good one, this one's a bad one, I can then take that 1,000 reviews and run it across millions of reviews and it will predict uh, the results of that. So I've got that file that I selected there. And what I can do here is notice that it shows me a preview of the, of the data. Um, and you can see here that one means it's a good review and zero means it's a bad review. And so what I'm going to do is give it a small subset of data to train it, um, and then it can take any data moving, in, moving into the future. So I'll come here and say, I want to predict uh, the sentiment is what I want to predict. Yes. Um, I want to predict that, and I'm next ready for my next step here. And I'll click Next to go to Train. Um, and I can tell it how long to train. So let's put in 25 seconds here for fun. And I'll say Start Training. And now, if you look here in my console window, you can see stuff scrolling through. Um, and then right here, you can see as it's running, it's going to be trying different algorithms to figure out which the best algorithm based on that data that I gave it to train was. There it goes, scrolling around. Going, going, going. Um, and it looks like it is done. Okay. So now that it's done, I can go to the next step. And basically what we do on this, sh on this sheet is we basically show you the accuracy of the various algorithms um, and we select an algorithm for you. Now the most important thing here is code. Um, there's a button called Add Projects. I'm going to add those projects uh, to my existing solution. It's not as integrated as I want. I'm running a, 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 an older preview. It could be better now. Um, but it basically adds these two projects, and one of these projects is my model. And so there is my, oops, there's my model down here, down here data models and model.zip. Um, and so now I've got all the stuff required to build a machine learning application. So I can go up to my dependencies, and I can say add reference, and I'm going to basically reference that model from my project. So now my, my web app has access to that module. And you might notice that there's some code that we stuck in here as well. We gave you some code you can basically paste into your application. Uh, so what I'm going to do is go to my pages, go to my review page. We had up earlier, and you sort of, I had hard-coded to be 50%. Um, I'm going to just cheat here a little bit. And I've got a version of that code hardwired to this. But I, I want to say this is it's like 10 lines of code. It's almost the same code you saw in that uh, the wizard generated. We'll comment this out. We'll paste this code in. And this code's not, nothing, nothing crazy here. It's basically make a prediction engine. There's a prediction method. It boots up the prediction engine. It, it uh, takes the, the data that you type, the text, runs it through that, and gets a result back out of it. Um, it's complaining a little bit because I need to actually add some references. So let's go and add those references right here. Save that. And now I should get an app that actually compiles and builds. And so you saw in what, four or five minutes, we add machine learning to this application. 
And I do want to be, be clear, I, I used a very simple model here. I didn't actually add a ton of stuff to it. Um, but now I can go back to this page, and now, Is that cool? Okay. So let's go back to the slides. So that's machine learning. Uh, the next thing is, um, I, I don't talk about it enough, but uh, you know, we acquired Xamarin two years ago, and Xamarin is a, is, is a, was a company building technology for building mobile apps on .NET. And I had mentioned that uh, before that the UPS application is built on this tech. And it's basically, it's an open source platform for basically building apps on any of the mobile devices out there, whether they're phones, uh, tablets, uh, or even uh, uh, watches. And uh, the whole idea here is to take the power of .NET standard uh, which basically allows you to basically build all your business logic one time and share it across Android, iOS, uh, uh, and the various devices that run on top of those things. So the idea here is um, you build your business logic one time, uh, you, you, but you can still ac have access to all the platform APIs, um, and you have access to native, native UI. So you can build native UI and make a button on iOS be a button on iOS, button on Android be a button on Android. We have a cool library called Xamarin Essentials, which wraps a bunch of the platform specific APIs, so you don't have to actually even call them. If you want to get the GPS location of a, off your phone, you can call into Xamarin Essentials and it will map to the right thing uh, based on the platform you're running on. So we're trying to make it easier and faster to build these types of applications. Um, we've done a lot of work since we acquired Xamarin uh, to make the product better. Um, if you installed Xamarin on, on VS 2017, I tried to not do this. Um, it was 23 gigabytes of, of increase of your, of your machine. Notice we've got that down to seven gigs. Uh, in 2019. So we're trying to make this better and smaller and faster. Um, uh, this is showing uh, how fast it takes to actually uh, create and build a project. And you can see in VS 2017, it'll take about a minute, while it's 30 seconds uh, in 2019. So we're continuing to try to make that tech work faster. I'm going to go back uh, to my machine real quick. And let's close this one out. Let's go here. Uh, this is a, a, that same application that I just showed you before. Um, it's a little fakery at this point, but uh, I'm still going to show it. What it's got here is the point of Xamarin was you can share tech across Android and iOS. So notice that I've got a shared project down here, um, and inside of it's got my model. So I take my machine learning model, I put it into a shared library, um, and then I can reference it from both the Android app uh, and the iOS app. This is the Android app up here, and you know, if I open up references, you're going to see down here, you know, I mentioned before TensorFlow, and you can see right here, I'm using TensorFlow. So each of these platforms, you want to use the native tech on the platform to get the best performance of the application. Um, and just uh, for fun, what I'll do is I'll just run the same app. And the point here is, you know, that machine learning tech, we want to make it available uh, across any of the devices. So no matter what .NET you're building, whether it's web, desktop, uh, you should get that exact same experience. So give this a second here. Uh, and what I'm doing, I've, I've taken that same tech, put it into a mobile app, um, and I can basically run this on Android or iOS. It says my app is running. Ah, look here, here's an app. And I think Ooh. Power of .NET, you could do the same thing everywhere. Um, so that's mobile. There we go, let's close that out. Now, let's start moving to some of the cool stuff. This slide's a little outdated. We just released Preview 6 uh, 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 about a week ago. Um, I'm actually running Preview 5 because don't install previews before you get on stage. Um, but uh, big things in .NET Core 3 that we, we care about is desktop support. So we're adding WinForms and WPF uh, to .NET Core 3. So you can build desktop apps the same way you build web apps. Um, 
Why would you want to do that? I'll, I'll drill into that a little bit. Um, another feature of .NET Core 3 is we have the ability to create single exe. So we've always had .NET Core, the benefit of .NET Core has always been full side-by-side. -side. I've got multiple .NET Cores on my machine, uh, but you can do multiple side-by-sides without breaking any, any applications. Uh, new with .NET Core 3 is there's a checkbox you can check and we'll take your .NET Core application and make it into a single exe that contains everything. Um, so you can actually build a uh, ASP.NET Core application or a desktop application, check this box, and no framework required on the machine at all, just copy the app and you're good to go. Um, we also have Blazor, um, and uh, Ryan from the team is going to talk about Blazor later today. Uh, I recommend that talk a lot. I'm going to show it briefly, but it does full stack development with, with uh, C Sharp. So you can actually write C Sharp on the server, C Sharp in your, in your, in your middle tiers, and then C Sharp directly on the actual uh, website. So you can actually write C Sharp in the browser. Um, and we have always performance improvements um, and new C Sharp features. So I announced a second ago that we, uh, we, we, we have WPF and WinForm support in .NET Core 3. Um, and the, this slide just shows that we've had the same uptick. A lot of folks ask me, is WinForms dead? No, WinForms is not dead. Not only is it not dead, we open sourced it uh, in December. And we're already taking contributions from the community into WinForms. We will for WPF as well. Um, and so we hope these things are going to be growing and uh, grabbing, grabbing stuff. But you can see here they have the same momentum that we had with uh, uh, Core FX. Um, here's the primary themes in .NET Core 3. Desktop apps, full stack web development, AI, and big data. We've already talked about AI and big data, so now we just have left is desktop and, and full stack. Um, so desktop support, WinForms, WPF, uh, Unity will actually pull this as well, and you get access to all the Windows 10 APIs if you're running on a Windows 10 machine. Um, why would you care about this? Uh, a lot of my customers today build desktop apps still. We have millions of customers building desktop apps, even though most of us are probably Webbies. Um, but you get the benefit now of not being broken by a Windows patch. Um, you get the ability to make that single Alexi I said before. And more importantly, you get access to all the API improvements we've made in .NET Core. .NET Core, because it's side by side, uh, we can make improvements and change APIs and break APIs and not get in trouble for doing it. Uh, today, you have to realize when, when, uh, .NET Framework is installed on over a billion machines. So a Windows update can break tons of apps. Um, but these core API improvements are where the next thing comes from performance. A lot of .NET Core apps are a lot faster than uh, .NET Framework apps, depending on which APIs that you call. So let's do a couple demos. Uh, of this. So what I'll do, we've got two, two demos here. Let's first off, let's talk about performance on the desktop. So what I've got here is I've got this app here. This is WinForms. This is an app I, I showed it build a year ago, uh, but I've recently updated it to use the latest bits. And so what I've got is I've got two apps. Um, I've got, uh, they're both exactly the same. The cool thing about them is this, this shows you how compatible .NET is. Notice that uh, I have a reference here to Telerik. So in both of these apps, I have Telerik controls enabled. Um, so let's run the .NET Framework app. And it's not super exciting. I'm going to point it to my source code folder. And I'm going to tell it to run. It's going to go iterate through all the files, build a chart, um, and show me how long it took to, to run. It took uh, roughly four and a half seconds. I'm going to run it again, just so I, it's warmed up. The file system's warmed up. 1.5 seconds, and it's using this grid to show me uh, the size of the folders and stuff like that. Now let's go over here and select the core version of this. Run it again. So we'll keep them both up here side by side so you can see them. And I'm going to run this thing against the same folder as I had here. So look at that. Half a second versus one and a half seconds. Three times faster. <laughs> so that, that's because the file APIs in um, .NET Core have been optimized, um, and they are, they're just better. Um, I'll show one more quick demo in desktop, and we can move on. 
this is, so we have previews, we're on preview six of .NET Core. We don't yet have the, we have the WPF designer running. We don't yet have the WinForm designer running. But because I work at Microsoft, I've got preview bits here. Um, and so I can actually show the progress we're making on the, the WinForm designer. I've got it here running. Um, I can press F4 to bring the properties up here. And I can do things like change the background color. Ooh, not exciting. Now, you, you might think, wow, Scott, why are you showing a demo of a designer? That's not very, that's not very exciting. You'd be surprised. The designer is actually hard, uh, hard to actually get, get working. Um, this is showing uh, my task manager with the apps I have running. And if I go look at Visual Studio, what's interesting here is you're going to see the WinForm designer is a secondary process. Um, and that's because you can only have one .NET in a project, and Visual Studio is written with .NET. So we actually basically have to move the thing out of, out of Visual Studio into an out-of-proc, and you're seeing a window from a different process here. Now, that's, that might be so, so exciting, but here's what's even cooler about this. I mentioned before the idea of being able to build a WinForm app into a single file. So I'm going to basically, I open my CS proj. We're going to get this to a point where you can do it inside of uh, VS with a checkbox. Don't have it yet. But what I've said is publish single file true. And if I want a single file, I need to tell it what architecture I want to use. So I said uh, WinX64. So now what I can do in Visual Studio, I think this works. Let's try this. Do a publish here from Visual Studio. And let's open a folder here. Let's go into bin, debug, net core app, win64, publish, single exe. Now you might you might barf and go, that's a 128 meg exe, Scott. That's kind of ridiculous. Um, th in the preview bits, they are supposed to be in preview six, which I which I have installed. We also are going to add a linker. So you can link out the parts of .NET Core that you're not using, which will cut that size in half. And then with the .NET that we're going to ship after this wave, we're going to do even more. And I'll talk about that in the slides uh, in a little bit. Now, so let's move on. C Sharp 8. Uh, we, you know, .NET, .NET Core 3 is not just about desktop. It's also about web and C Sharp. And so this is a, a slide here showing a bunch of C Sharp 8 features. This is probably some of the ugliest C-sharp code I've ever seen in my life. Um, um, I, I asked Mads Torgerson on the team to basically take every C-sharp 8 feature and put it into one file. Um, and so that's what you see here. Um, I'll highlight some of this, and I'll open a project up and, and show a few things uh, on the C-sharp 8 side. One is ranges. Um, and so you notice here on the, on the get customers, I'm actually passing it something saying, hey, I, I, wanna, I don't want the whole array. I want part of the array. So ranges let you actually specify uh, where to start, where to end, or you just want stuff in the middle, uh, any place that you take an array. Um, nullable reference types, the question mark on customer. This is a new feature. We actually have a feature in, in, in C Sharp now that will help you find null reference exceptions before they actually happen. Uh, and I'll do a demo of that in a second. But that's what nullable reference types is. Um, async streams. We've had uh, uh, async support with await for a long time. It never worked over I enumerable. And so now async await works over I enumerable. You can see here I've got an I, I async enumerable uh, that I then do an await on. Uh, that's new in, in, in C Sharp 8. Um, and we've got this, this crazy switch expression, which you don't have enough code here to actually understand, but I'll bring a project up so you can see it. Um, and we have other things like recursive patterns, default implementations, uh, and so on. But there's a whole bunch of, of, of awesome value coming in C Sharp 8. So let me jump back to a VS here. <clears throat> and let's open up C Sharp 8. OK. So here's a project. It's that, that exact same code that we were running before. And I'll make some of this stuff go away so you can see better. And you're going to notice here that, uh, first off, I am using that range feature. I say I want everything up to the second element on, on this. Um, so I'm using a range right here. 
Um, and if I run the application, what you're going to see is um, if I go, let's go bring the Solution Explorer up real quick, and I go to Properties, what I've done is I've passed some parameters in here, one, two, three, four, five. Uh, they're passed in the command line. And so what you're going to see is when I run that, only one and two came through because I said, I only want the first two of these. That's the range feature. It's pretty cool. Uh, the next feature that we have here is here's the async uh, enumerable. Um, so I've got down here, I've got my uh, static async, I async enumerable that returns some data. Um, it's got some scots in it. And, uh, but notice it does have some nulls in it as well. And so what, what happens then is just to make it for demo purposes, I kind of slowly return these from the, the async thing here. Um, and what this switch statement does is does crazy stuff. I take the customer, I do a switch, um, and this, this is basically saying if, if, the, if the first name and last names are null, then return a null. If I only have a last name, then we'll add a miss, miss, miss or mister on, on the front of it. If I have both, we'll add both and write it out. Now that's, that's kind of cool, but what I really want to show here is I'd like to show the, the uh, support for nullable reference types. So what if I did something like um, this? What I don't know here is customer could be null, and the values inside of customer could be, I could do something, let's, let's try this. Let's do uh, console.writeline, like we all would do, and I would say customer first. Now notice that Visual Studio is complaining. It's saying dereference of a possibly null reference. It's like, Scott, you, you might be screwing up here. Um, and so because customer can be null, and I never checked to see if customer could be null, customer right here is saying it could be null, um, the compiler is complaining. I have to actually do this. It's going to force me now to put that check for that squiggle to go away. Notice no squiggle now. So you turn this feature on, and it will basically, the compiler will force you to put null checks around code that has possibly null values. Um, we're actually in the process right now of doing this in our, B, our, our own BCL. I think it's one of the coolest features, and we'll save all of our butts many times in the future. Um, our telemetry shows that null, 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 null exceptions are the most common exceptions in, in uh, .NET. Uh, so let's get back to web. So we've talked about C Sharp. We've talked about desktop uh, performance a little bit. Let's talk about web. We have a whole bunch of cool tech in web uh, that's new, gRPC. So people ask me, Scott, uh, there is no WCF in .NET Core. Um, I want fast RPC-based, contract-based um, APIs. I used to use WCF for this. I would build a, a file describing the API, um, and then I could basically generate the client and get a nice, tightly integrated thing. So uh, gRPC is a project from Google um, that we're actually contributing for and making sure there's an awesome .NET support. Uh, Preview 6, Preview 5 both have support for this uh, inside of, of, of Visual Studio. Worker service. This has been a misnomer. Um, customers come to us all the time and say, Scott, how do I write microservices in .NET? I'm like, you just write them. Um, but they're like, well, I don't need controllers, and I don't need views, and I don't need all that stuff. And so the worker services are, are, is our kind of acknowledging this, where we can basically say, hey, yeah, there are some things that want to use all the benefits of ASP.NET, things like uh, dependency injection, configuration, um, uh, logging. But I don't need to have views and controllers and stuff like that. And so worker service is the beginning of get, having a mechanism to actually build services uh, using .NET Core. And then there's web APIs and, and identity. This is probably the, and once again, these are all such, such common problems that I get hit with. Scott, I want to, I want to secure my web API. I just talked to a customer uh, a week ago, and they actually published an app into production with, without any security on their APIs. And they're like, oops. Um, so we are going to make it very easy to add a identity server to any of your web APIs so you can actually have rich um, API control. And so. Um, Time-wise, I think we have enough time to do a couple of these demos. Um, one of these is I want to show gRPC. 
Anything I'm showing at this point, I want to let everybody know. Glenn Condron is after me, and he's going to do a lot of demos and talk a lot about, about using ASP.NET Core without using HTTP, without using views, without using MVC. Um, then Glenn later today, I mean, uh, then Ryan later today is going to do a, a talk on Blazor, which we're going to get into just a little bit here in a second. So I recommend both of those talks. So let's look at uh, a worker service. So what I can do here is I can say I want to create a new project. And I will do an ASP.NET Core application. This is kind of a misnomer because it's not an ASP.NET Core application. Um, and I'll say worker service one. And click new. And now it's going to ask me, and you're, here's some of these new choices. Here's worker service. Um, notice we also have Blazor down here. I'm going to click worker service. We'll click next. And this is going to create one of these new ASP.NET Core or .NET Core technically applications that gives you all the, all the .NET Core, ASP.NET Core stuff, uh, but for long running processes here. So let's go open the Solution Explorer up. Stick it over here. And so I look at my program CS. It's going to be very simple. Booting up the same kind of host you would have in an ASP.NET Core project. But my worker process is very simple here. Um, it's basically got a, a, a execute async. You write all your code here, and this runs for a long period of time. And notice this app is very simple. It just basically spits stuff out to the log using the same logging technology we have in ASP.NET Core. Now, where this gets kind of cool is, great, I've got a service. Imagine you're building a microservice and you want to host this thing uh, on Linux or on Windows. Well, you might want to turn that into a, a service on Windows. So how would you do that? Um, I can go up here and say manage NuGet packages. And let's go do this. Notice there's Microsoft extensions hosting Windows services. So I want to turn this thing into a Windows service. It's my, it's my, it's my API. I add this one package to it. And I just screwed up. So we'll take this package back out. Notice I clicked the preview six package. Bad. Preview five. Happiness. OK. So hopefully that did not destroy my project. There we go. Um, I can go back to program.cs. And right here, I can now do dot use. And notice that Windows Service shows up here. We're working on one of these uh, for systemd as well. So you can do this on Linux as well. So the idea is you have a way of building a service uh, on Windows or building a service on uh, Linux. And so now I actually can build a, a Windows service. And just to show that real quick, let me uh, drop to a command prompt. Go into there, go into here. And all I'm going to do is I'm going to .NET publish this service. Um, and I'm going to specify my output folder to be CBAC service. So this basically says, hey, build the application, and then take the results of that and put it back into CBAC service. Because it's not good to have a service running out of your, uh, your current folder here. So there we go, CBAC service. There's the app. Um, and then I need a command prompt at this point, or, or an admin prompt. So let's go and app open this again, run as administrator. And because that app has that package in it, What I'm basically doing here is saying create, uh, saying create a new service in Windows, set the bin path equal to service slash. So I just created a Windows service. Now I can start that Windows service. And now, if I go look at the event viewer, because that service was writing to the event logs, writing to, using our logging, 
um, we'll now see it actually running here. So this means if you want to build a microservice, host it as a Windows service or on Linux, there you see. Here's my worker spitting out output to the screen. We built a Windows service in like five seconds. Is that awesome or what? Semi-awesome. So we'll kill that. Don't want that running anymore. So that's, uh, that's services. Now let's go back um, and, and show something crazier. This is the final version of that machine learning application. And if the internet's working here today, this doesn't like it if the internet doesn't work. Uh, but let's try this. I've got a version of that, same app, um, and I have a service in that. But in this case, my service is using endpoint routing, uh, which is a new feature or kind of an old feature in some ways. Um, imagine, as I said before, you want to build a, a web app. Uh, you want to build a service, but you don't want to have controllers and views and all that kind of stuff. This is, once again, uh, it's not written in a worker service, but it should be written in a worker service. This is an ASP.NET Core app, um, but the entire app is in one file. I mean, this is, notice here I've got program CS. I got the, the whole app is right here. And so down at the very bottom, you're going to see my host builder starts up. It runs my startup. Uh, but unlike before, notice that instead of booting up MVC, I say use endpoints. And then I say, hey, if it comes to this location, uh, that's going to be a, a, a signal R client. If it comes to this location, I'm saying this URL, wax in, slash grade, slash lat, slash long, slash client, um, run this code. This is true microservice. That's an ASP.NET Core application in, in 20 lines of code. Um, and to show it working here, let's put a breakpoint over here. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to start the client up first. This is the same machine learning app I showed before uh, for that sentiment analysis, uh, but it's a little fancier. I've added one line of code to the review where it sends the result to a back-end service. So let's go back here. And let's debug the heat map. Let's see if, yes, success. OK. So this is showing a map of where these requests come from. Here's the app. Let's go back to the app real quick. And I want to show you just one quick piece of this. This is the same. Uh, review you saw before, but now when you click the button inside of the review, it takes the results, sends it to the launch, the lat, and, and whether it was good or bad, uh, to the back end. So I should be able to come over here and do things like this, bad, not good, and I can press submit. That makes my endpoint fire in the browser here, so you can see my, my one you know, my non-view, non non-controller ASP.NET Core application runs here, my microservice. Um, I'm going to let that run through. Hide the breakpoint. And if I'm lucky, look at that. So Glenn's going to go deep into all this, this microservice-y kind of stuff in his talk right after mine today. Highly recommend that. Um, so let's get to Blazor in the time we got left here. So the next thing is, and I said uh, Ryan's got to talk on Blazor later today as well. So Blazor, um, full stack web development. We know we've we've had always had great support in .NET for building uh, any kind of web UI, whether it's web forms or it's MVC or it's Razor pages. Uh, but we've always had people ask us. Scott, when are you going to build your own Angular or build your own React? And I, I'm like, I don't want to build JavaScript libraries. They, they get out of date too quick. Um, and so we kind of stayed out of the space. We've had great, we've had great support in .NET for Angular and React. Um, but in the back of our minds, we've always wanted to build something where you could run C Sharp everywhere. And so Blazor lets you actually do what we call full stack web development. So I can build uh, the client and the server all in .NET. You can run .NET in the browser. Um, all browsers support this technology, uh, the mobile devices, the desktop devices, everything. Uh, but what's even cooler is we have this new technology called WebAssembly. And it allows you to actually run C Sharp 
live in the actual browser. Um, and, and typically I go, oh no, it's going to be Flash or it's going to be Silverlight. Um, and it's going to be insecure. Um, but all your apps today, when you run a browser, when they're running JavaScript, they're running it inside of a sandbox. And so uh, WebAssembly runs in that same sandbox as the JavaScript does, which means it can't get out and touch your machine. So your WebAssembly code can't you know, modify the file system or the registry or any of that kind of stuff. Um, but we, compile it, we can compile it down to like native WebAssembly, which means you don't have to actually run an interpreter in the browser. Uh, and I'm going to warn people, today the, the, the Blazor tech we show is using an interpreter. The AOT tech will come uh, with some slides that I have a little bit later on. Um, so let's do a quick Blazor demo. As I said, Ryan's going to talk later today um, uh, on this, and he's going to go way deeper than I'm going to go. I don't have time to go super deep, because I want to make sure we talk a little bit about uh, what's beyond um, .NET Core 3. So let's just go right to the Telerik Blazor app. If I have time, I'll come back and run one more Blazor app, uh, a crazy one that shows every piece of tech we have um, at the same time. This is a, let's compile it and run it. This app, you know, notice it says loading. Oh, it's slow to load. It's, it's got to be a spa. Um, welcome to modern web. So this is a spa app. Meaning that you know, as I click on stuff, the page doesn't refresh. I click this, it went and called a web API and drew the data. Um, it's always kind of fun to show, um, you know, when you're in this kind of tech, the network stack. You know, you run the application, and uh, then your boss freaks out when all these DLLs come down because we're basically running .NET on the client here. Here's the data annotations system.runtime.dll. So this app is actually running C Sharp uh, inside um, the browser. And so as I'm making these calls and stuff like that, I'm not making calls to the back end anymore. This is all just running native on this, on this app. So you get this great spy app. But you're just building, if I go look at the code, um, you know, this code is no different than typical .NET code. So here's my, my uh, counter. I've got my counter here. It shows the current count using razor syntax. It's got a button, but instead of calling JavaScript on this button, it calls with the at sign, it calls into C Sharp, which is right here in this function block uh, with the current count in increments. So you can see that we're running C Sharp in this instance. I want to show one particular thing uh, as part of this to give myself plenty of time to get to the next thing is um, one of the complaints we've always had um, as we moved into the Razor world and the MVC world was we didn't have good support for components. We didn't have a component model. So if you look at this app, um, this is the, if the forecast is null, then show loading, like while we're waiting for data to come in, uh, do that. As soon as the forecast call actually completes, that's down here. Notice that uh, my on init feels like a, uh, a init kind of thing you might do or a page load in a, in a web form application. It calls this to get that data. Um, while the data is null, it shows loading. As soon as the data comes in, we just draw a table and we loop over the table using typical C-sharp razor kind of stuff here. But it's a spa. This doesn't run on the server. It runs on the client. Now, what's cool about this tech is, as I said before, we have support for components. So I can come here and say, you know what? The table is great, but it kind, of, kind of sucks. I want fancier technology than that. Um, and so because we have a component model again, this enables control vendors, again, to write components uh, for doing the web. And so in this case, I'm showing Telerik. And notice I've got a Telerik grid. Um, I pass it that same forecast data. Um, but I can set a bunch of cool things. I want it to be pageable, sortable, filterable. Um, and then I need to tell it what the columns look like. Now in the past, this would generate awful HTML and stuff like that. But with, with modern web, uh, this is actually amazing. So I took that same app. I drug in one control from Telerik. I run it again. Still, once again, as I said, this is a client-side application. It's not running any of this C-sharp code on the server. It's running it all on the client. Now, my weather forecast looks beautiful. I can sort. I can come over here and say, filter. And so we are going to make you so much more productive building web applications because you're going to have access to these rich components to give you these awesome features, but you're still using modern web tech. 
you're running in the browser uh, uh, in the client. Super fast. So that is Blazor in a quick, yes, thank you. So the real question is, what comes next? So, you know, um, this is kind of scary because I, know, I actually know what's next for this, this, this year. I know what's next for next year and probably even the year after. So I, we, we have .NET kind of nailed for the, for the future for a while. We have a bunch of, bunch of stuff coming up. But this is kind of how I think of where we are with .NET today. Um, I remember in 2016 uh, or 2014 when I uh, was looking at this at, at .NET, I'm like, we have a mess. Uh, we have .NET Framework, and it's, we have it for historical purposes. It's the single .NET that we built to start with. It's on all the Windows machines, but we struggle with it because it's on Windows machines. It's on 1.1 billion machines, hard to patch uh, without breaking applications. So we built .NET Core, super high, fast, open source, cross-platform, all the goodness. Um, and so I thought I only had two of these. Then we bought Xamarin, and then I'm, dang it, Scott, I've got three .NETs again. Um, what am I going to do? So the first thing we did is in 2016, we created something called .NET Standard. This is basically a spec that all these .NETs have to follow, uh, saying that if you want to be a .NET, you have to implement all the APIs in the spec. And the idea was uh, to facil facilitate code sharing across all three of these .NETs. Um, it was a step. What we're kind of announcing now is this. Let's take all that. Basically, let's take Xamarin and, and our, our Mono and .NET Core, merge them together into one single .NET again, where we have uh, one runtime that can be either jitted, just-in-time compiled, that's what you do today, or it can be uh, native, meaning you can spit out a native application that does not require any interpretation on the, or jitting or anything at all on the, on the uh, machine. Uh, that's required for Mono uh, and Xamarin for iOS apps. You can't put... Uh, jitted apps onto an iOS device. Let's have one BCL. It's kind of crazy. That, that picture I showed before, we actually implement three BCLs. We have teams that work on all three BCLs. Um, uh, and let's put all that together into a single .NET. And so we're going to call this .NET 5. So this .NET 5 supports all app types. I can build a mobile app. I can build a web app. I can build a desktop app. I can build an AI app. I can build an IoT app all on this, dot, on this thing. Let's take the best of all these platforms and merge them together. So one BCL. My team doesn't have to implement three different BCLs. They can implement one BCL. Let's take the uh, new SDK style project. So as I was showing the demos today, I was using that new CS proj format that's actually human editable. Um, that today only works in uh, .NET Core applications. That will then move to Xamarin applications as well. They'll use the same exact tech. Let's take the best of just-in-time compiler we have in .NET Core and make that available to Xamarin projects. And let's take the ahead of time compile or native feature where you compile to a native application uh, and, and pull that from the, from the monotech. And because it actually we're using some of the monotech, you might even be able to call Java and Swift directly from your C-sharp code. Um, so this is .NET 5. Uh, we, should, we should be clear also what's not in .NET 5. .NET Core 3 is the last version of .NET Core that we're porting new features into. So this means WCF, Windows Workflow, uh, and System Web will remain on .NET 4.8 only. Uh, but we have, we have great modern re replacements for those. If you're building a, win a web form application, if you're still a web form developer, Blazor is where you should go. Um, if you're using WCF, you should look at gRPC um, as a place to go. Um, and if you're using Workflow, there's already an open source uh, version of Windows Workflow that has been ported to .NET Core, and it's actually sponsored by a big company. So it's, uh, it's pretty cool. Now, not, not just that. That takes us back to here, where we have a unified platform, all these app types running on one single .NET, you're taking all the best of Core. So we're still not going to, this is not .NET Framework again. This is Core, um, meaning that it's going to be small. Uh, it's going to be side by side. Um, you only have to use the bits you want to use. We're not forcing you to have the whole thing in your applications. So it's a new, modern version of .NET. Um, but let's go beyond that. We talked about .NET Core 3 a little bit today. What's the schedule for .NET Core 3? Preview 6 is out now. Uh, Preview 7 will be out next month. Um, and Preview 7 will be our RC. So pretty much, except probably Blazor, 
Um, if you're using Preview 7, you should be, have a pretty high confidence that code will actually run on the RTM builds that come out later this year. In September, we will actually ship the RTM of .NET Core 3. We've already got the date, and I'll show you a date slide in a second. Uh, we have an exact date it'll come out on. And then we'll have our, our, our 3.1 LTS, our long-term support version, uh, that'll come out shortly after that in, in uh, November. Now, people ask me, Scott, what's the future of .NET? Is you got two more versions and you're done? Uh, no, we're actually going to change the way we, we, uh, we do our schedule. We're actually going to go to an annual cadence. So uh, next November, there'll be a .NET 5. The November after that, there'll be a .NET 6. Uh, so on, so on, so on. So we're going to have a regular schedule where every year you get a brand new .NET. Every other year, you get a long-term support version of .NET. Um, and so this is going to help our customers knowing when the next version of .NET is going to be there. Now, I just mentioned, September is our release date. We will have a virtual conference uh, called .NET Comp. We do this every year. Uh, September 23rd will be the RTM date of .NET Core 3. Um, and we'll have this online event where you can watch Half of it will be people from, like me from Microsoft talking about .NET Core 3, um, and the other half will be people from the community uh, talking about .NET Core 3. So save that date. Um, and just, I just want to recap. Um, we continue to add new workloads to .NET with ML.NET and the Apache Spark stuff. .NET Core is the future of .NET. Um, you know, what we would tell customers today is, if you're building a brand new application, you should be using .NET Core. Um, especially when desktop comes out uh, in, in September with 3. Um, but at the same time, if you have apps on .NET Framework, don't just move them to .NET Core. .NET Framework is a great solution. It's going to be around forever. Um, but new apps should be on uh, .NET Core 3. So that is the end. Thank you folks very much. Please go see Glenn and Ryan Sessions. Thanks for having me. Thank you.